And we cannot allow that goal to be changed with administration changes. And we, uh, we, we need to stay very focused. And any change has to have the full approval of Congress. And I think that is crucial to, because we're, uh, we're involved with programs that have 20-year horizons. They'll span five presidential administrations. And we have to be very focused and be, you know, be able to commit through those administrations to the end goal. And to that end, I often say that uh, those of us that come to hear programs like this have an obligation to let our Congress people know that if this is what we're interested in, this is what we need to get them to act on in the way that we think is appropriate to make that happen. Kathy here? Yeah, you'll take a message back. Just checking, take a message back. Okay, wonderful. Uh, you know, looking down from Earth, Chris, is uh, an incredible experience. I often think of it as being a mind-bending experience. You said that uh, your first flight was almost like sensory overload because of everything that's going on. How did you ever get used to the idea that you were in space and, at the same time, flying a craft when you were actual pilot and commander? How did you, how did you get used to this idea of the fact that you're in space. You have a huge workload of things to do. I understand that it takes up your time, but at the same time, you must be sort of standing outside of yourself saying, oh my gosh, where am I? Yeah. I, I have a theory, and, and my theory is that so much of what you see and experience while you're up there is almost, it, it's surreal enough to be registered in your mind as a dream. And when you get back, if you do not write these things down quickly, you will forget them. And I, I learned that on my first and I thought, gosh, what did I do on this day? And what did I do on this day? And what did I do on this day? I couldn't remember. Didn't write things down quickly enough. So it, it is, it's almost a, I don't want to call it an out-of-body experience, but there are moments where you're looking down upon the earth, rush by you at five miles per second, and just the beautiful colors, the hues, the purple, you know, the blue, the green, uh, just how the ocean is, and you're watching it all underneath you. It's not my hand over the antenna. There we go. I must have. Um, but you, uh, it really, it, it truly is amazing to look down on our planet. And the interesting thing is, there's, you can't see any country borders from space, with a, with a couple exceptions. But uh, you realize, and, and then as you look at the horizon, you realize how, and you can see our atmosphere. I mean, our atmosphere is just, in the grand scheme of things, is just a razor thin colored layer of gas that surrounds this, this big blue marble in space. And several people have had this reaction. They look upon it and they say, that's it? That is our entire atmosphere right there, that thin little wedge that appears on the, on the horizon. And that is, you know, it's really at 40,000 feet of really uh, reasonable air. And it, it, it gives you a, an appreciation for just what a, a fragile oasis that we live on uh, is. And uh, it compels you to want to take better care of it. Uh, so there are, there are unique moments in space. Uh, and one of them is certainly looking out the... Uh, looking out the window. But uh, I, I, I took the data point last time. I write things down now when I'm all done so I can remember them. So SCS-135, final mission. Um, what are your thoughts about that, the final part? And uh, what's next for you? I mean, you, you're, you're a young guy. You could uh, well, thank be you heading there. back to the moon, or he paid me to say that. Or you could... Uh, <laughs> Possibly head on to Mars? No, you, yeah. Now, look, I think I'm not quite Mars uh, age bracket. I think that the person who's going to land on Mars is maybe perhaps that young lady from Spark uh, there. Mm. We need, you know, an interesting thing about Mars is Mars is always 20 years in the future. And what most people, I think, do not realize that, and Mars has been 20 years in the future for, say, the past 30 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what most people don't realize is, is technically Mars is well within reach. I mean, we can go do it. The cost is extraordinary. I mean, but we have what it takes today. It would take um, kind of this relay team of fuel uh, precursor missions out. We're going to put fuel in orbit around Mars. And we're going to put fuel at the halfway point so these vehicle with the humans in it can refuel. Uh, we're going to make our fuel on the Martian surface for the return trip. It's a very interesting, very compelling mission when you, when you look at it, but it's always 20, uh, 20 years in the future. So I don't think I'm going to make Mars. Um, I, I, you know, I, I could stay at NASA and help them work with the space launch system. Um, I could perhaps go work for one of these uh, commercial companies that's looking to put uh, men in low Earth orbit or, and women in low Earth orbit. Um, I, I'm not really sure what I'm going to. I'd like to do what I like to do, 
and, and wherever opportunity presents itself that allows me to do what, what I enjoy doing and where I think I can have the most impact is where I'll, where I'll go. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a science museum nearby that might consider you. <laughs> but, but the chief astronomer job is not open. <laughs> so the door is always open. Door is open. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, one of the reasons why uh, you're here this evening, of course we are uh, glad to have you back from space and uh, congratulate you on a fantastic mission. Uh, but you actually did something very special for us. Uh, for the Franklin Institute while you were traveling in space. And uh, you have something for us. I do, and it's right here. Huh. Uh, it's, uh, it's still wrapped up nicely in, in NASA gift wrap, which is this uh, little hermetically sealed uh, wrapper we put on it. But uh, this thing that I'm going to present back to you, and I'll let you describe exactly what it is, uh, accompanied us uh, on STS-135. It's a segment of the original Fells Planetarium. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, it was very nicely prepared inside uh, some, uh, some plexiglass or acrylic. Uh, and we, uh, like I said, it accompanied us. It uh, oh, made about 186 revolutions of the Earth. Uh, it's got about 5 million extra miles on it. And I'd like to present this back to you uh, so you can hang it in a place of prominence here in the Franklin Institute. Thank you very much. Sure. That's great. Thank you. So I'll try to tell a story about this quickly. Um, back in March, uh, you know, I have the most fantastic job in the world. No, you <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. Almost. Pretty close. You could help me out with this, too. Uh, in any case, I have a really great job, folks. And the reason why I say that is because I got an email from Christopher Ferguson one day. Boy, does that ever make my day. I get an email from Christopher Ferguson asking if we would like to fly something on board this final mission, STS-135. And of course, of course we would, absolutely. The only question is what? What do we fly? Chris gives me about a week and a half, two weeks, to figure it out and get something to him. So I pull together a team of uh, folks here at the Franklin to try to figure out what we might be able to fly. When we renovated the Franklin, uh, when we renovated, renovated the Fells Planetarium in 2001, 2002, we took the old original panels of Fells Planetarium Dome down. It was stainless steel dome and had been up for nearly 70 years, and we replaced it with this really lovely, much lighter weight aluminum material. Of those, uh, uh, one of those panels that we kept. We uh, excised, if you will, a number of the stainless steel stars, and we gave them as gifts to a few people here and there that were significant to the Franklin Institute, so on, that sort of thing. But this came to mind as something we could fly, and we thought it was appropriate for these reasons. Under that dome, in that time, sat approximately 9.5, 9.85 million people, almost 10 million people, have sat under the Fells Planetarium Dome, look, learning about space for the first time. And so we tried to figure out if there is a way in which we could share that experience with so many, with, uh, share with that many people the experience of going to space. And we also thought that it would be appropriate to return a star to space. So we chose to flow this, fly this. The only problem is, this is a stainless steel ninja star. The points are extremely sharp, as are the edges. And I know for a fact that this is not something that NASA is very much interested in flying unless we can make it safe. So we asked a, a small team of our prototyping group here at the Franklin Institute, led by Eric Welch. He worked with uh, Kyle Stetz to create this absolutely gorgeous jewel case that you see. It is uh, three pieces of acrylic, the two outer pieces of acrylic on either side, and a very thin piece that actually holds the star in place and then riveted together with these five stainless steel screws. Uh, the criteria I gave them were, uh, were that it had to be completely captured, it couldn't be any bigger than four inches, and NASA had to be able to see it so that they could inspect and test it in any way they wanted to make sure that it was safe. And sure enough, they did this really beautiful, beautiful job. Uh, we've just gotten it back today. Thank you very much, Chris. And we will put this on display in one of the display window boxes outside the Fells Planetarium so that everyone can see it and know that um, the Franklin Institute has been to space. And so uh, I want to express our great thanks to Chris for 
getting this job done for us, taking this up to space, taking Ben Franklin, the Franklin Institute, and uh, all of our uh, visitors, friends, and folks at the Fels Planetarium Dome. Thank you very much.